Uh, I, yeah, there have been crashes. Uh, the superpowers on the Earth have had their share of crashes, and they have recovered the vehicles from their crashes. So uh, that's why Shock and Lee and I agree that even though these things behave like a conscious psychic entity, they, they do have a advanced technology. They have hardware. And uh, there, there's a craft. And there's occupants, or euphonauts, that he calls them, that Shock and Lee calls them euphonauts. <laughs> so there's uh, euphonauts running these craft. Uh, the point is, is that... Uh, that these things are operating, they go way outside the envelope of our engineering and physics technologies, and and uh, uh, I can guarantee you that no laws of physics are broken whatsoever. It's just that it's either uh, the existing laws that we have, but we haven't uh, extrapolated it further enough, further enough, or expanded it enough into realms or uh, say areas of phase space where we could discover new solutions to uh, these existing physical laws, which would give us advanced propulsion and power that would produce this type of technology once you have an engineering and a manufacturing technology to create these things. So that's where we're at. And these things don't look like anything that we can manufacture on Earth, so we don't have the manufacturing or industrial technology for it. Were you involved with ATIP? Yes, I was. In what, uh, in what respect were you involved with ATIP? As a consultant. And then the OSAP program was where I was actually a subcontractor. As an employee here, uh, we were a subcontractor to Bigelow uh, Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, B-A-A-S-S, uh, on the OSAP, which was the other side of ATIP. ATIP was handled out of the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, and OSAP was at the Defense Intelligence Agency. And that's the actual funded program that received uh, enough congressional appropriation to hire outside contractors like uh, Bass and Earth Tech to work on the programs. Okay, so you 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 ult you ultimately worked for were part of the Pentagon's UFO program. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What kind of what kind of stuff did you do for the Pentagon UFO program? Oh, basically, uh, what I just discussed was. Uh, we, we had, um, well, first of all, we gave technical advice to the field investigation. We'd get information in, data on reports, and we would do physics analysis and uh, report back on what, we, what our opinion or assessments on the field investigations and data was. A la siete, a la misma altura. Hay unas nubes, ahí se ve, debe de estar. Anyway, that looks like an elegant, simple equation. It's really not. It's 10 nonlinear partial differential equations with symmetry conditions and boundary conditions. It's a nasty mathematical mess, but it's a lot of algebra. The basic premise of Alcubierre's warp drive. Here's the starship. The space-time grid is flat here around the starship. He feels no forces and no acceleration, no curvature. This guy's not moving. He's sitting in flat space at relative rest. He isn't moving and doing anything. It's the warping of space here and here that's moving him. It's like a surfer on a surf, and the uh, wave of the surf is carrying him toward the beach. This is called the flam diagram, and what it shows you is regular space-time, right here, right there. And here's point A, and here's point B. 
For faster than light space-time geometries, you know, to give you the, uh, the space geometry of curvature that you need to make a wormhole or warp drive, requires a type of matter that's exotic. It's not like the tor type of normal matter that we're all made out of. And it turns out it's exotic because it violates some heavy-duty mathematical conditions that Stephen Hawking invented back in the 70s. And the type of exotic matter is negative vacuum energy. No problem. We've got negative vacuum energy. So this is what a spherical wormhole looks like. If that's the sun in the background and a throat is opened up, there's a negative energy uh, shell around here. You would see a galaxy shrunken and distorted. It's inverted. You'd be looking through. It's like, a mag it's like an inverse magnifying glass. Here's a stargate opened up in Times Square. This represents the stargate solution where the, uh, where the wormhole is not spherical. It's got a flat door-like opening. And here's another version of the flat door-like opening there. So Einstein went back to the drawing board with relativity theory and he said, what happens if I include forces and accelerations in space-time? Well, a big startling thing happens. You warp space. You basically come up, you basically end up replacing Newton's laws of motion and gravity. Uh, all forces and accelerations are replaced by curved or warped space-time geometry. that. This is the benefit of recording infrared, all the weird shit that comes up. Shit. I can barely see it so fucking bright. This guy's just chucking orbs into our atmosphere. Remember, space is so big that light speed is slow. So if distances are measured in light years, it's going to take light years, you know, years for light to reach those. Well, a traversable wormhole says, let's take negative vacuum energy and let's create a shell of it around a location, open up a, a throat, push space open to form a throat, and thus you have the throat of the wormhole. And instead of going this way, you're going to go through the wormhole and it's, a, it's like a hyperspace tunnel, a shortcut from point A to point B, and you bypass this, all this distance and all the years you have to travel. Instead, this could be a matter of a few days or a few seconds of trip time, and you've effectively moved faster than light. For a wormhole of a radius of 1,000 meters, you're going to need negative 710 times Jupiter's mass, equivalent. Remember, the ener it's really energy, but I turned it into mass units. For a, a wormhole of 10 meters diameters, it's negative seven times Jupiter's mass. And for one one-hundredth of a meter, 0.01 meters, 
your uh, wormhole energy requirement is going to be negative 23 times Earth's mass. He looked at taking the warp bubble and pulsing it at high frequency so that you can lower the energy demand on average and you crunch all your energy into a peak pulse width uh, spaced out in very short time intervals. That's what we do in directed energy weapons. That's how you create high-powered laser weapons. This thing won't be able to produce megawatt power, but I can produce megawatts of peak power if it's pulsed up to megawatts, and the average taken over time is going to be very low energy. Were, was ALSAP and ATIP, did they coexist at the same time? Uh, pretty much. ATIP came before ASAP because of the Nimitz encounter. So almost almost simultaneously, uh, ATIP came a little bit before, but they coordinated. And they both ended in 2012? No. A, no, ATIP never ended. ATIP never ended? Nope. It's still going on today? Yep. Who runs but it? Not by that name. <laughs> oh, they changed the name? Change names, change location, change leadership. So oh, what's, the new, goes on. what's the new name? I can't tell you that. <laughs> so the reason you know this is because you are still on the inside. Oh, I'm I'm a consultant still. Yeah, you are I'm still a consultant. You are still a consultant for the program formerly known as ATIP. Correct. 